Hello, welcome to the Studio Utani podcast. I'm Matt Georgios, and today we're going to be talking about Marvel Comics Alien One. Uh, this will have spoilers, uh, just be aware, uh, in case you have not read this yet. Um, but we're just going to jump right in and uh, do this off the cuff. Uh, initial thoughts on it. Um, when I go into any story, the thing that I'm looking for is what's the hook? What's the thing that's going to keep me invested in what's happening and what's going to carry me through the character's journey, basically? And that includes not just, you know, who the characters are and, and whatnot, but what's the dramatic question uh, that this series is posing? And just, you know, from re first reading the comic and uh, from rereading it right before this video, I don't feel like I got that. I, I don't really feel like I got a sense of, you know, what this story is about. I mean, I know that we've got the main character of Gabriel uh, and, you know, he's got a, you know, these repressed memories and there's some conflict uh, with his son. But really to me, where it's kind of missing the mark is, I don't know what's at stake, basically. It's kind of like, I, I get that he's trying to recover these lost memories. I get that, you know, he's got some problems, you know, connecting with his son. But what what's going to happen if he doesn't, you know, fully remember the story? And that's kind of where I'm at with it. So it, it's kind of a lot of exposition, but there's no real dramatic question. And I don't really know if I fully understand who Gabriel is enough to really be able to formulate that in my head. So like, for instance, if he if what he stands to lose is like his relationship with his son, he, it seems like he already doesn't have a very good relationship with his son. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow it definitely. I'm gonna continue to follow the story and see where it goes, and maybe maybe it'll catch on at some point. But I feel for such a high profile release and for something that a lot of people have been excited about, I feel pretty underwhelmed uh, for the most part. Artwork. So uh, one of the things I was telling Clara going into this is that. I'm not really a big comic book guy. Uh, I don't really read <laughs> comic books and I'm not too familiar about like the trends of the industry. But kind of the thought I had, uh, just kind of seeing the, the artwork for the first time from this, um, I was like, this looks like a comic book. And <laughs> I, I don't know, I, I don't, necessarily find that style too appealing it's it's kind of like how i feel a little bit about like alien resurrection which say what you will about that film um i kind of feel like it's a very typical american uh blockbuster in just in terms of the story uh but you know bringing jean pierre junette to it they they gave it some really interesting um uh, sensibilities are uh, artistically and of course it's uh, because of that it became a very unconventional blockbuster uh and i think that's always been very unique about alien because it really if you look at the four main alien films they're really all kind of the same story but they all feel so different because of different directors and i think that's kind of the appeal of it it's a very director driven franchise in a way so for me, it's kind of a setback to bring Alien into a style that we would expect to see from comics. Clara was showing me some pages from Alien Dust to Dust, and immediately I was struck by the contrast between the artwork in that versus for Alien 1. I was uh, much more impressed because it's like immediately you're given this sense of perspective the lighting or the shading uh, of the artwork 
creates a much more dramatic tone where you can really feel what those characters are feeling the the fear and the oppressiveness of you know the the struggle that they're facing um that for me in the uh alien uh comic from marvel i felt was kind of just more by the numbers and again maybe there's an appeal here that I'm not seeing. Maybe if you read Marvel regularly, there's something about that style. That's just the way it looks and you've grown accustomed to that and that's you. And, and maybe that even extends to the story. You know, maybe this is just the kind of writing that you're used to. Another thing that really stood out to me as I was reading this was the framing. Film and comics are both mediums that tell stories visually. And while I think something like Dust to Dust is a pretty good job of getting its story across, Alien 1 is, is a little bit messy. I almost fall back on the dialogue a little bit too much to kind of understand what's happening. It's kind of like this. The exercise that, you know, we had in film school was, and something we were always taught to be kind of mindful of, is that your film, you should be able to get rid of all the dialogue and get rid of all the audio, and we should still kind of be able to understand the story. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that dialogue and, and the visuals should support each other. If we look at something like the first big money shot with uh, all the aliens and uh, the, uh, the thing that kind of looks like Sill from Species, kind of the problem I have with it, and I think it's a cool piece of art unto itself, but I almost feel like it's missing the mark in terms of the story that's being told because we're getting Gabriel's, you know, commentary about what he's seen and about half of that, uh, of the text, of the dialogue is talking about um, her, the queen or the alpha or whatever she is. And the way that she's framed in the shot, she's kind of off to the side a little bit. And while there is rule of thirds, I almost feel like because this is our introduction to this character and because we don't really see her again and because she's being set up as a prominent character, you know, maybe possibly an antagonistic force, I, I feel like she needed to have a little bit more prominence on the page. In the, the scenes, between uh, Gabriel and his son uh, in the house, there's like a really weird dramatic close-up on Gabriel when his son, and I, I forget the son's name, uh, the, the son, he says he's gonna leave after, after he's just arrived. And of course we know that he was just there to pick up the, uh, the chip so that he could get into the Wayland yutani facility, but almost comes across as like forced drama to me. It doesn't feel organic to the story. Close-ups are very important uh, shots in any kind of visual storytelling medium. You really want to be careful with your close-ups and make sure you use them at the right dramatic points. And I feel like that was not the right dramatic points. But the other thing that people have been talking about is the weird tracing. I, I'm not a cop, again, I'm not a comic book guy, but as an artist myself, I, I, I can look at like, for instance, that money shot and I can tell that though, that the aliens are being drawn from, from life. It kind of looks like they set up action figures and we're basically drawing that. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing, but I think the problem I have with it is they don't feel very organic to me they really just don't feel like they have any life. And I expect something better coming from a company like Marvel. I, I, I've been ragging on this comic and I, I do want to talk about some of the positives of it. Um, towards the end, once we get into the scene um, in the Wayland yutani uh, office on the station. I, I think I started to kind of get into it a little bit more. I like the sudden jump from, you know, the kind of the casual banter with the Wayland yutani employees, and then suddenly um, the, the uh, terrorist group. Uh, once they jump in, you know, it, it, the story kind of picked up for me a little bit. 
and I like the whole thing in the lab at the end when the alarm goes off. That's really kind of for me when some of the drama started to kick in. I think the reason for that might be that it was the first time in the story where I kind of felt like we were dealing with characters that had something to lose. And that made a pretty big difference in how engrossed I was in the story. And there is a tantalizing cliffhanger. We just see a face hugger launching at one of the characters and it's like, well, okay, what's gonna happen? You know, that that's, that's when it really did start to kind of pull me in a little bit more. But I almost feel like it's like 90% exposition and then like 10% story at that point. And I don't know if that's really enough to grab me personally. And I'll say this, the story that's being told here does hit most, if not all the beats that you expect from an alien story. There's the creepy crawly stuff, there's the body horror, there's the monsters, there's the corporate whatnot, there's the working class sentiment, there's the androids. It hits most of the marks that you would expect. I, I guess for me, the the thing with, um, with this, uh, with a Marvel's Alien 1 is, I, I, on one hand, I really do, I, I do kind of admire um, Marvel kind of doing their own thing with the franchise, but kind of like what I said at the start, I don't feel like this story really grabbed me. And I'm going to continue with it, but at this point in time, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of mellow on it. So those are my thoughts about Marvel Alien 1. Uh, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. And if you didn't like this video and you think I'm a total idiot, please like and subscribe and let me know in the comment section. I'm Matt Jarjosa, the last survivor of the Studio Utani podcast, signing off.